I think we should get started. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Carla Freeman, and I direct the Foreign Policy Institute here at SAIS, and I also teach in the China Studies program, and I have a foot in the ERE program. So it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you today. And uh, this is a Foreign Policy Institute Energy Resources and Environment Joint uh, Program. Uh, and I'm especially delighted to uh, open it because it is a student-driven uh, event, uh, one that our, our Patty, um, also known as Patricia Rojas Correa, uh, it organized as the leader of our Art of Diplomacy program, and that Stephanie Aoko from uh, Energy Resources and Environment and perhaps others uh, worked on uh, through that, that program. So it's, it's wonderful. It reflects a really intense student interest here at SAIS on, on the topic. And also because we have so many uh, burgeoning energy and climate experts here, uh, policymakers and perhaps diplomats uh, in this arena, a really deep-seated interest in, in learning from experts who work at the intersection of climate change and foreign policy and diplomacy. Climate change requires uh, international cooperation and collective action. So the student organizers have outdone themselves by gathering such an extraordinary group of experts uh, and to whom we are all very grateful. Thank you very much, Professor Schunover, Ms. Smazniak, Diplomatic Secretary from the Embassy of Chile, Mr. Solar Solas, for sharing your insights today. And I also want to thank today's moderator, Emily Holden, uh, who is herself an expert as a, an environment and climate reporter, now working for The Guardian here in Washington, uh, and before that at Politico, and uh, she joined Politico after already deep experience at E&E uh, News. So there's so much to dis discuss today, very little time. And so let me welcome well, Emily Holden to the podium, again, with many thanks to her, our panelists, our student organizers, and you, the audience, for joining us today. Thank you. I think I'll actually just do some introductions from here, if that's okay. Um, so since we have such great expertise up here, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to read their bios, because I think that'll help everyone understand what we're talking about. Um, so we have uh, Kim Smazniak, who is the managing attorney at Earth Justice, an environmental law firm, where she leads its legal advocacy to ensure a fair playing field for clean energy and federally regulated electricity markets. Under the Obama administration, Kim served as lead mitigation negotiator for the U.S. Department of State climate negotiations team, shaping strategies to ensure rapid implementation of the Paris Agreement and deepen U.S. engagement in support of climate mitigation. Prior to joining the State Department, Kim served as counsel at the State Environment, Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. Uh, Dr. Rod Schoonover is founder and principal of Ecological Futures Group, which is an organization which seeks to understand and articulate the societal and security implications of global ecological disruption and climate change. He is also currently professor at the BSFS program at Georgetown University. Prior to this role, Dr. Schoonover served in the U.S. intelligence community for a decade as the Director of Environment and Natural Resources at the National Intelligence Council and as a senior analyst in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the U.S. Department of State. Pablo Solar, if I have any breath left, <laughs> is uh, the bilateral diplomat at the Embassy of Chile to the United States of America. His responsibilities include portfolios on environment, defense, Antarctica, and cybersecurity issues. Sounds about as broad as my beat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Pablo was previously appointed to the Embassy of Chile in Trinidad and Tobago as Deputy Head of Mission from 2015 to 2019. So um, just in our previous discussions and what we thought would be most important to emphasize with a group of students, I think we all agreed that we wanted to talk a bit about what is physically happening to the earth because of the climate crisis uh, and what the scale and the scope is of the climate crisis and how it's being communicated. Um, and Dr. Schoonover, would you like to sure. open for us? Thank you. Sure. Thank you for, uh, thank you to SAIS for having uh, me. Um, I love coming here to speak to students. Um, I'm actually a scientist by training uh, before I got involved with the uh, U.S. government and the underbelly of the government in the intelligence community. Um, and I'm a physicist by training. So just, I think most people know about the greenhouse gas effect. I think it's worthwhile just to mention it because of the scale of effects that um, are underway. For example, uh, 
it turns out that our atmosphere is transparent largely to incoming radiation and less transparent to outgoing radiation. Right? So uh, it's an oversimplification, but uh, that capturing of outgoing radiation by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases is primarily the warming effect of the troposphere, which is the bottom layer of the atmosphere. This thermal energy cannot be contained and it spills, if you will, into other parts of the earth, into the oceans, into uh, the cryosphere, the ice, into organisms. So it's really important to step back and realize that the term climate change has actually evolved to capture a lot more than just what's happening to the weather and to the climate itself. And so the temperature of the earth is rising and anything, any process that is temperature dependent is potentially affected by that thermal rise. So that's most obviously seen in the melting of, of glaciers or ice sheets. Uh, and that's a significant problem. But it's also true that, um, that organisms who are temperature uh, dependent, for example, the biting frequency of mosquitoes is temperature dependent also. And the geographic range of species is temperature dependent. So there's a whole bunch of physical, biochemical, ecological, agricultural processes that are potentially changing. Now, the more complicated you get in that system, uh, there may be some offsetting processes that regulate, but, uh, but that's the scale and the scope. There are very few parts of the earth that are not going, undergoing change. I didn't mention the chemical part of how, when carbon dioxide dissolves into the ocean and acidifies um, what was already a weakly basic, what weakly alkaline system. And so uh, those two dr big drivers along with changes in land use are, change, are uh, presenting a, a pretty large physical change to, uh, to our planet. Right, so I, I think I think the uh, the way that I hear this from most of my sources is that you might hear mostly about exacerbated hurricanes on the news, right? Like you're usually going to hear in climate reporting, you're going to see climate change coming up mostly in an isolated event that happens that is worse because of rising temperatures and the effect on the planet. But it's actually something much broader that we're seeing across really every sector of the economy. So basically, whenever I get the chance to speak to you know, to an audience, I try to make the point that uh, the, the more you can think about it in a bigger aperture than a weather aperture, right? Extreme weather is highly important. Sea level rise is highly important. There are only two of the multiple changes that are underway. So, so the question was about the scope. There's your scope. Um, the, the other uh, important factor um, is also the, the rate of change, the, the velocity of change, uh, which is also um, quite important in terms of ability, natural ability for, say, organisms to, uh, or, or, or people to, um, to adapt. So the rate of change is also uh, astoundingly high. I can go into more detail, <laughs> but I, I kind of, you know, these discussions can go really dark really quickly. <laughs> and so, um, but I, I thought just a framing, just so that you and that everyone is on the same page, that right. all things that are temperature dependent have the potential to be changing. Right, and most things are temperature dependent. Right. <laughs> so, and, and a little more context for that. So, uh, recent studies have shown that the the world is on track for about three degrees Celsius of warming from uh, since industrialization. So um, and right now we're already warmed about one degree Celsius and we're already seeing impacts of that. Three degrees, we'll see much more severe impacts. Uh, how far are we from negating that? Um, so the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement were to aim for no more than two degrees Celsius increase in temperature, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius for, for lesser impacts. <laughs> 
um, how likely are we to make it to those goals or even to avoid three degrees Celsius? Kim? So um, yeah. when um, we were engaged in the Paris Agreement, there were, we recognized that the pledges that were put forward mm -hmm. Um, under the Paris Agreement were going to be not sufficient to achieve that level of ambition. Um, and that's been acknowledged. I think it's you know, widely understood that everyone's first set of pledges does not get us there. And so globally, what we need to see is for every country to ramp up at a much faster pace than what we've seen um, in terms of the transition away from fossil fuel based sources and other uh, sources of greenhouse gas emissions. So we dramatically need to increase that ambition and pace of change. And that is a challenging political task. It is a difficult task to imagine changing the existing infrastructure that we have at that pace. But that is what the science tells us we need to do. Um, so I think the answer is right now, we do not see the political action that we need to see. And the science tells us that we need to change that quickly. And is that just in the US that we don't see the action? Or what about other countries? Uh, no, it, it's um, really globally. Uh, we know that China is the biggest emitter today. Um, China has a target that does not uh, hit the pace of reduction that we know that we're going to need to see in order to achieve that 1.5 or 2 degree goal. It's simply not there. It is pretty dramatic what we see as in terms of the change in China. Um, they did have put forward what was an ambitious target from where they are. They have a tremendous amount of coal based energy. They still have a lot of development ahead of them economically um, in order to rise uh, levels of poverty in the country. And so they set what they thought perhaps was politically achievable and they've made tremendous uh, advancements towards the goals they put forward, but that doesn't change the fact that in order to get where we need to be by what the science tells us, which means a remarkably different landscape by 2050, including in places like China and India, where we've allowed for in the Paris Agreement some expectation that some developing countries will be, uh, ha the change will be happening at a slower pace given where their economies are, but we still need to see tremendous amount of ramping up of ambition um, across the board. The most ambitious of countries, you know, the EU people put out there have a lot of ambitious targets. We still need to see more. There are uh, segments of the economy where we haven't begun to tap the kind of change that we need to see in order to achieve these goals. Right. So essentially, um, most even most climate reporting, I think, uh, until the last couple of years is focused on the electricity sector, because that's kind of the easiest part of the economy to decarbonize even though it can be challenging too, but we also have to look at transportation, agriculture and land use and industry uh, sources of emissions as well. So, and we know that the US is the, the biggest historical emitter of greenhouse gases that are causing the climate crisis. Um, and so China has essentially agreed um, as being the, the biggest current emitter to stop growing their emissions at a certain point. Is that accurate? Yeah, they have a what was called a peaking target that they had appointed, which they're going to um, peak their emissions and then start to curb them. They had a number of ambitious goals that were more particular around forestation and solar deployment, renewable deployment, um, a number of different components coming together as a part of what they thought that they could achieve. Mm -hmm. So that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, we know that the U.S. is far off track from its goal too, right? So uh, the U.S. said that it wouldn't reduce its emissions 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels by 2025. I think the analysis that I saw from uh, the firm Rhodium Group showed that um, at best the U.S. is on track for maybe a 19 percent reduction. Um, what effect has that had and how uh, global leaders and negotiators are looking at their own country's commitments? Have, have we seen an effect of the U.S. not meeting its goal? Of either, any of you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, in general, I think the the effect that uh, that the U.S. announcing that he was uh, pulling out from the from the Paris Agreement actually was uh, some some reverse effect. Like it uh, busted many other countries to reconfirm and to and to uh, get more committed to to the fight of, to climate change. What um, is also very important to to uh, highlight here is that even though the, the the U.S. government is pulling out of the Paris Agreement, they are not pulling out of the UNFCCC 
uh, convention. So they still have been part of all the negotiations. They still have been, are being part of, of everything that is being talked about. And even though they, they just announced, they are pulling out and they're just introducing the, the, the proper paperwork to, to pull out, they, that won't be effect, uh, uh, effective until 2000, November 2020. So The day after the presidential election. Exactly. And that will be a factor also from my personal point of view in the, in the next uh, elections. But it's also, but it's also what, uh, what happened inside the US is, and I think it's very important, is how many states and cities committed to, even though that the, the government is, is pulling out of the Paris Agreement, they will keep for, moving forward with that. So you have the, um, the US Climate Alliance, which is the, the union of 23 states plus two territories of the United States that are committed to, to climate change and to, and to fulfill their, their, commi their commitments to the Paris Agreement. Or you have the C40, which is a union of cities around the world. Mm -hmm. And actually Washington DC has a very, a very uh, important policy on, on reducing carbon, carbon emissions. Right. And so, so there are many places I think are sort of uh, at the beginning of that process of setting their goals, um, but they don't necessarily have binding goals that they can present to other countries to say, right. we have already passed the laws and this is how we're going to reduce our emissions in this exactly. sector, this sector, et cetera. But you think that that still had an effect on that other countries see that as the U.S. participating? Yeah. I, and I think it also has a very important effect in terms of um, increasing the ambition mm -hmm. because there's one party's countries agreeing on something. And then there's also the general population that is agreeing on doing something. So you still have very uh, like good effects on, on that, on, on how the rest of the population keeps committing to, to those, to those uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about the negotiations themselves? So- Can the, I jump in real yeah, quick? Yeah, sure. Just, can I, um, so, I, I can already feel I'm going to be the pessimist on the panel. Uh, so <laughs> That's my job, my, Brad. My, sorry. And, so, <laughs> uh, and I was part of the intelligence community that knew how to bring bad news. Uh, and it's, but it's also something based in objective truth. I mean, that's really what the intelligence community uh, strive to do. And so I think it's really important to recognize just a couple things. Um, the, the two degrees Celsius target is so difficult to hit at this point uh, that uh, perhaps as a, as a planet, we should adjust uh, the target. Um, you know, that's my personal opinion. I, I think you know, the, the most you can take temperature down, the better. Every 0 0.1 de degree matters, um, but uh, as Kim said, you know, even following the Paris uh, pledges only takes us down, takes us about to a three degree Celsius, uh, you know, plus some error bars trajectory. That, that's really bad. Um, the, and, and my second point is, in no way should we describe the United States pulling out of Paris in anything but a very negative thing happening in terms of global efforts to reduce uh, the effects of climate change. You can find other bright spots uh, and, and the ones that uh, were mentioned are really important. Uh, but let's not forget that the United States uh, and you know, I've watched this happen over a decade in, in, within the United States government, pulled China into the Paris Agreement, pulled India, pulled the Middle East countries, pulled a number of other countries, helped at least, if not outright muscled them into, a, uh, into an agreement. The idea was always all along, we knew that Paris commitments weren't going to be enough and that further actions to ratchet up uh, ambition was part of the system. And by pulling out, not only have we lost the authority in, in, in speaking and in trying to get other countries to ratchet up their emissions, 
but I think the, there's a chance we, the United States has broken uh, trust in the international governance uh, arena. Uh, and it's going to have to do more than if, if it, say, the next uh, administration decides to sign back on to the Paris Agreement. Uh, they will have to do more than just say, we're going to mm -hmm. sign back on. I think something more has to come. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I think we should not minimize the damage that we're drawing from a voluntary uh, agreement system uh, may have done. And I, I would just amplify that because I think it's a really important point and also really relevant to the value of diplomacy behind what we saw um, in the successes of the Paris Agreement. The absence of the United States in this is um, you know, twofold. There's this lack of the ambition on the part of the U.S. that becomes a benchmark by which other countries set what is success. If the one of the biggest emitters is not at the table coming forward with ambition, why is anyone else? And then there's also the fact that the U.S. just has a tremendous number of other diplomatic levers to use in order to bring people to the table when they don't want to. If it's important to us, if it's important to our Secretary of State, if it's important to our President, the leaders of other countries are going to end up hearing about it and care about it a lot more than if we don't. Um, and that's the, the, the delta, right? Us leaving Paris is not just a mechanic of leaving a treaty body. It's the whole impetus of the di diplomatic apparatus not being used to bear to advance these goals. Um, and it's just a tremendous power of diplomacy when you use it well. I saw it as a fantastic tool and saw the results of the Paris Agreement because of that power being aligned and working with other countries to see where are the lanes where we can advance, what resources, what support can we provide, what sticks can we use, what money can we you know, bring into this conversation that will help. All of that ends up being on the table and it's not now. And it changes the dynamic and it changes the outcomes we'll see. And we don't have the time to lose. Um, so I would agree, this is, is a really, it's, it's more than just the mechanical moment of pulling out, it's the entire behind it that's missing that changes the playing field. Right. And so what we hear about most often is the decision to, to exit the Paris Agreement, probably because it's one of the more dramatic decisions related to climate change, because it makes the U.S. the only country that's not participating, plans not to participate. Um, but when you look across the federal government, you see that the Trump administration is rolling back every, you know, small initial attempt that it had made under the Obama administration to regulate greenhouse gases from um, rules for, for coal-fired power plants to rules for uh, how much mileage cars need to get. Um, and those are all going to be challenged in court. But um, even, even if they are upheld at some point, in the meantime, they won't be enacted. And that will mean that there's a, a big gap in emissions reductions that, that could have been happening. So um, just to talk about what you said about the, the Paris Agreement, um, even if all of the countries complied with what they volunteered to do, we'd still be hitting three degrees Celsius. How, how, how did that happen and what was that like in the negotiations process um, that the countries only agreed to something that is really, I think most of the world would agree, not an acceptable target? So, I mean, I, I don't think that was a failing of the negotiations. It was built in. You understand that we knew each uh, country was going to come forward, they're cyclic, cyclic pledges. And so we know the whole idea was when you first start investing in clean energy, it seems like we can't do this. And then as you know, the costs go down globally, the tremendous events, investment potential, the cost declines you see, it gets easier. Political barriers that used to be in the way, industries that were opposition, that changes over time. So the entire negotiation, the idea was let's build in political moments where we can both say countries will come forward and to say, I'm going to pledge to do more, ever ratcheting ambition um, was a key part of it, and creating moments where there's a bit of a political stage where everyone has to say, let's check in, are we doing it? We called it the global stock take. There's a provision every so many years, five years. Everybody comes together and says, are we doing it? Are we getting there to that two degree goal? And assessing across the board and recognizing, you know, when you first come forward, you're doing something new. You don't have the trust across the global community. You're not going to have the ambition that you can achieve in later phases of the effort. But it was meant to create a virtuous cycle, build trust, and um, also connect to international financial flows of money that would support for developing countries. So all of this was supposed to come together in a you know, global effort that would help us all move forward. 
Um, is it hard? It's one of the hardest tasks we're trying as humanity to do this at this pace. So of course there might, there's this risk of failure, but this seemed like it would help us get the infrastructure in place that would enable the global community to come together and do that work. Um, so it was built in and we said, let's get the mechanisms so we know that we're gonna continually do better. Can we, can we, um, can the world continually do better with the U.S. possibly being largely absent from the process for the next two negotiations? Do you think there's a, a lively strengthening of goals? Of course it can. Yes, of course it can. Will it? Yes. Pablo, will it? I hope so, yeah. I think so. Um, it'll be very hard, though. Mm -hmm. uh, we need that, that international community. The world needs the U.S. It's such a mm -hmm. massive country. And we need the U.S. I think you're a little far from the microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, what I was saying, um, as you said, will it? Uh, I think uh, in in general, uh, it's going in the right direction. Even though you have Brazil or uh, that are changing their politics, Mexico also changing their politics. Um, India and you have important players as India, as the Middle East countries, and. Um, I'm more optimistic. I think it, uh, countries are willing to do it, but in but we need the U.S. Mm -hmm. for sure. What What is your? Can you talk about your country's commitments and well, how they may or may not be strengthened? Well, no, we are strengthening it. Um, we were supposed to uh, have the the COP now in December. Mm -hmm. uh, internal situation didn't allow it, unfortunately. So we keep the presidency. We move the 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 event the the entire com the conference to Madrid Madrid accepted uh, Spain accepted kindly to to host it uh, but we are we are very very committed um, we, and, and Chile is bringing to the table the the ocean which is a long forget uh, issue in the in the UF UNFCC triple C so um, we have been changing our energy matrix in the last ten years. We have been uh, trying to uh, rise our NDCs. We are uh, aiming to be uh, carbon neutral by by 2050. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have we are, and, and and the good thing in Chile is that environment and climate change has has become more than a governmental policy, more than to a state policy. We have three administrations already that are committed to raise the the bar in, in that in that matter. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, what negotiations are like on, on the ground, but um, I, I also didn't want to pass up this opportunity to talk about what we mentioned, what Rod said, Rod said about uh, readjusting uh, the two degrees Celsius goal and what that would look like. So we've seen recent reports from scientists um, who all together wrote about how bad they could see this crisis becoming, um, talking about untold suffering, we know that it, the climate crisis could push millions into poverty, uh, displace millions from their homes, um, far beyond extreme weather. Uh, one, one study that really struck me that I think sits with me um, in terms of how specifically we can see these impacts playing out is um, one that was being looked at by the University of Chicago and um, they're calculating a social cost of carbon to figure out how much is climate change going to cost us. And they are examining this study that showed a connection between uh, a one degree Celsius increase in temperature what, and what that would mean for crop failures for farmers uh, in India and then connecting that to uh, the, the average increase they were seeing in suicide rates. So we know that this has uh, you know, massive public health implications um, beyond the things that you would typically think about, you know, people dying from heat related deaths, uh, not having air conditioning from you know, um, diseases that can spread more with mosquitoes. And when you start looking at it all, you see the, the large effect that it can have um, on the economy and really just human society. Um, so Rod, do you think, or, or I would say all of you, uh, is it time to have more of a discussion about helping our societies be more resilient to these changes and adapt to them in addition to trying to prevent them? I know that can be a tough political discussion do you, do you see a way forward to have more of that discussion internationally and domestically? So just speaking for myself and, you know, I, I think I did say that we should adjust the target to 2.5 degrees Celsius. I really didn't mean that. Uh, <laughs> um, 
the, the target should be as low as possible, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, but you're, you're hitting at um, something I think that's quite important. Um, and that's the thing that I didn't say at the very beginning, but I think a lot of people know about the idea of locked in climate change that, you know, we're, because of the long life of, of carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere, you know, current global emissions reduction policies affect the climate, especially with social inertia, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. We're living in the uh, world that was affected in the 90s and the 80s. So there's a disconnect between action, emissions action particularly, and thermal warming. And so I think it's worth a discussion and certainly in the national security community, this is something I brought up quite a bit. If we're locked in for 20, 30 years of committed warming, what are we doing about the national security implications in the meantime? How are we reducing that? Uh, because yes, Paris is, you know, is going to change the trajectory or whatever uh, uh, mitigation a strategy we have that's going to change the trajectory into the 21st century. What are we going to do in between Rob, that? Rob, what do you mean by security implications? Are you talking about uh, like instability <clears throat> fueled by drought or yeah. so? I mean, it's how a, broad does it go? It's a whole host of things. So for you know, for the United States, um, you know, things that significantly affect the human security of U.S. residents. I, is arguably national security. So uh, especially things that are preventable. So for example, wildfires and infectious disease patterns and things that really affect the fabric of our society, I think are clearly national security issues. On the foreign side, things that occur abroad, we're talking about um, uh, disputes over resources like food and water, arable land, um, patterns of political instability, uh, pr conditions preventing already f fragile states from uh, developing global patterns of infectious diseases, uh, surprise, uh, changing environmental conditions, having impacts on militaries, not just the United States military, but others, um, opening of geostrategic domains like the Arctic. Um, I can just go on. It's, again, it's not, a, you know, it's not always a, a pleasant conversation, but um, you know, enhanced human movement on the planet you know, have, uh, you know, have caught the attention of not just the United States national security community, but the national security uh, uh, communities abroad. And so, uh, so, so I answered your question, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Could you just briefly give an example? I think sometimes we talk about climate change as a future threat too much without talking about the current threat. What, can you give an example of um, something that has affected the US's national security already that's related to climate change? Uh, an easy one is the, um, again, I'll just talk not in domestically, I'll just talk about foreign. The, the drought that has happened in Central America, uh, which was uh, unusually intense over a period of two to three years, has a climate change fingerprint. How much? The scientists are still figuring. Uh, that out, but it certainly has an, an effect. And in fact, one of the things that probably we as citizens should pivot towards is, you know, instead of asking whether X, Y, or Z event was caused by climate change, instead say something or ask something like, to what degree did climate change make this more intense or more rapid or whatever? Because we're in a world Again, with that thermal, that temperature effect that I was talking about before, and then the ocean, uh, ocean acidification effects, it, it impacts practically everything to at least a small degree, mm -hmm. and in some cases, large degrees. Um, and so the, the migration that came out of 
um, Central America, right, it amplified a lot of other conditions, um, you know, that, that added to civilian strife. But the impetus to move forward, to move northward, affecting our border policies, right, and our own elections, especially state elections on the border, have, a, uh, have at least a loose, if not stronger, connection to uh, climate change. So, and what you're talking about in part there is attribution science, which is getting more and more refined, the ability of scientists, especially quickly, to, to look at a, a weather event or a climate event and say how much of this might have happened right. um, because of increasing greenhouse gases. Right. Um, so, uh, Pablo, you said something very interesting um, when we were preparing about uh, your, your background as a psychologist being helpful <laughs> um, in international climate negotiations. And I was hoping you could expand on that and maybe you and Kim can talk a little bit about what, what the atmosphere is, is like at these events um, and what you go in trying to achieve and what you expect. Well, I think in diplomacy in general, being a psychologist mm -hmm. helped a little bit. <laughs> um, and I don't think it's as related specifically to the to these events or 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 to COP only. Uh, it has to be more on how you can assess the situation and how you can measure what things are going on. I mean, you walk into a room is and even though I'm a psychologist, mm -hmm. you don't read people's mind, so you don't know what they are thinking. But in general, you can see perhaps certain patterns and, and you can prepare yourself in a position that's like, okay, I can perhaps try to see uh, two or three different scenarios that where mm -hmm. I can uh, work and move forward from. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's, it's, that's not only because I'm a psychologist, that also, that, that also can do it people that has a lot of experience in negotiations in general. Mm -hmm. So that's why, uh, events as, as the COP are so important that have to have senior officials that are very um, experienced, uh, that they know very much about what they are talking about. They know the, the, the specifics, the, the technical points. Who know the people from other countries too, right? Sorry? Who know the, their counterparts from other countries. Right, too. yeah, and, and then again, and diplomacy is, even though it's a big world, it's not such a big world. Mm -hmm. You see, especially in those, so in those situations, you, you see the same people most of the time because they have more than one conference a mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. So you see them all the time, especially the negotiation team. Right. So I, I've always thought that I, I've uh, had the privilege of covering one cop and it was like both the most exciting and most boring thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's massive. It sprawls across this huge campus. The one that I covered in Bonn, we had to have bikes to go back and forth between the two tents. Um, you have these booths in like a separate building that's not even where the negotiations are happening where you can go in and um, you pick up a headset and there might be a person speaking uh, Mandarin um, and then you like dial to the right channel to get the translator to English and you can have a translator for you know five six seven different languages in these tents and just hear all these separate side events that are happening on all these other issues so there's a lot about the ocean the one I went to and ocean acidification and increasing goals there um, but like what what is it like um, when you're more like in the negotiations room, um, which I'd love to come into. <laughs> Unfortunately, they usually don't let the reporters in because um, from the outside, it can seem like it just moves so slowly and things that seem like news to negotiators were like, yeah, that like barely changed. It's one word different, you know? <laughs> That's exactly what it is. Um, so one, just the big conference of parties that comes together, that big meeting that happens is a culmination of you know, months and months or years and years in the case of the Paris Agreement of work behind the scenes mm -hmm. to move people's positions. There's not just uh, everybody comes in with a text and then we hash it out over the period of those few days. Um, there's been a lot of positioning that happens. There's been caucusing that happens over the course of a year, figuring out where you have alliances with other different caucuses of countries to understand shared interests. All of that's pre-work. Um, and the bigger the deal is, like the Paris Agreement, there was a lot of pre-work to get to where you could come and say, we're going to see a landing zone here. Uh, but then when you actually get to that big event and you know you have some window in time in which you have to try to figure out those areas where we still have lack of agreement. It really is the painstaking process that Emily described. It's, you know, there's, 
uh, usually representations. You can't imagine all of the, you know, more than 100 country parties in the same room at the same time for moving the negotiation text forward. So things break down article by article. There's uh, a discussion going on um, with represent representation of different negotiating blocks will be in the room. They have had to pre-decide what their positions on, what they're willing to give go on, and what they're not willing to go on. And then every night, you know, as you go through this process, there's then what happens after the negotiation officially in the room stops, or even what's going on at the same time that that negotiation is going on inside the room. Who is actually meeting outside the room? Right. Sometimes you'll have principals who are meeting who are making the deal that will allow the people in the room to then move the text. So all of these things, what you see is only a tip of the iceberg. There's the conversations that happen you know, late at night where people are pulling things together. Could you do it this way? Writing on scrap paper, trying to figure out what could, they, what could you get to move it forward. And some pieces of the deal, particularly something like the Paris Agreement, are gonna be held till very late in the game. You know it's gonna be the midnight or after midnight, we're already into overtime for those negotiations. And people aren't gonna give that up until they really know they've gotten everything they can on the table for their position. Um, so I, I just have to say that some of the, um, the mechanics of how it looks, like who is running that conference of parties, like in uh, Paris Agreement, it was uh, France, um, you know, it would have been, you know, Chile. Um, so who, who are those individuals? The care they take in setting up that process and building trust and ensuring people feel that they have um, the right opportunities to weigh in on what are those deals and negotiations going on, that matters. There's an element to which how well that process is laid out really affects outcomes. At the same time that countries direct interests um, you know, there's certain things countries are never going to agree to because it's not in their interest. Some of that, there's some immovability around it, but there is some part of the process itself and the personalities involved that change what you get at the end of the day. What are the levers that the U.S. can pull that you mentioned? I mean, I imagine one is like the Green Climate Fund and the money that developed countries will offer um, for other developing nations to ramp up their goals. Um, what, are, what are some other levers in diplomacy? Just generally, I mean, it's all, you know, certainly money, but um, all of the other provisions that are up, uh, you know, in the negotiation mm -hmm. can be tweaked a little bit in the direction. And it may seem like, you know, very little difference to a lay person. But if you're thinking about what is the implication of this text, which then will have implementation processes, there will be a process in which we say, okay, so we have this article, mm -hmm. now we need to actually implement it. And so a tweak in a couple um, lines of text can make a big difference to whether a country's interests are in the scope or out of the scope of what that includes. So it's just really everything that is being addressed in the negotiate, negotiating text. Um, so for example, you know, the islands, they, the small island developing states cared a lot about, do we get to refer to the fact that we have a 1.5 degree goal? Mm -hmm. You know, is that's critical to you if your entire existence disappears if we get to two degree warming. So, you know, that was a crucial thing that's on the table in, in these discussions that they would want to see that, you know, could be traded off with other aspects of the agreement. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, there's a whole number of different things and it depends, you know, when you're in a multilateral negotiation, you're trying to figure out the lanes of what you can trade across mm -hmm. parties that everybody's happy and it's hard. And I would say just very briefly, some of the levers exist outside of the climate uh, change space. For example, getting uh, the joint presidential announcement between President Obama and President Xi from China, a lot of that negotiation was outside of text. And it, I mean, some of it was inside, but really I think it was the opportunity for the president of, uh, of China to stand next to the president of the United States on an equal billing. And so there's a, this other diplomatic um, lever that, you know, the United States was willing uh, to go to. We're going to start taking some questions if you want to have people queue here. Um, and Pablo, do you have anything that you would, you would add to that? What is it that uh, maybe your country is looking for when you go into negotiations from other countries? Well, we don't have the big leverage that the U.S. have, mm -hmm. of course. So, in, in our case, and also in, in this case, holding the presidency is how to, or, or taking the presidency, 
um, is how we can try to um, make different parties, different countries to, to come to an agreement in different, in different aspects. And it's more of, it's a, different, it's a different situation because being the presidency, mm -hmm. you don't get to give your opinion that much. It's more like coordinating. Right. You get so to set the agenda if, a little yeah, bit Exactly, more. so mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit stressful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but in general, what we seek is a lot of us as a, as a continent in South America, is, what are the things that are important to us? We mm -hmm. also have to get together and form alliances with different countries and, and, and see what we can reach and what are the important points of, for us and, and how we can move forward and, and bring them to a table and bring them to the negotiation and, and, and get something out of it too. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks. Thank you all for a nice comprehensive overview uh, of the negotiations and diplomacy and, and climate change. Um, I, 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 I would like to cycle back to that, the national security concepts mm -hmm. um, that you raised. I'm going to say your last name wrong. Rod. Rod, thank you. That's a good first name. Um, there have been, in you know, very, very well respected globally and nationally in the U.S. People from the intelligence community, people from the mili uh, U.S. military, um, and from the security fields like Sherry Goodman and General Wesley Clark, who've talked about uh, climate change being the greatest threat to our national security. And they cite different examples than, than one of the ones you gave, but you have so many, I, I get it. But one of the ones, uh, it has to do with some of the the, the bases uh, on coastal, you know, potential flood flooding areas from, um, you know, rising storm surges and so forth, and that, you know, demolition of the infrastructure. So they're working a lot on, resi you know, resiliency, exactly. and I think in some cases moving uh, bases. So um, I I'd like to hear a little bit more about that side of. Uh, national security, but then I'd also like to touch on a, a different aspect of the national security um, question, where it concerns diplomacy, because if we have effectively retreated from these, um, from the Paris Agreement and some of the other international agreements outside of climate, like the, you know, the Iran um, Nuclear Weapons Treaty, what, um, how does that affect our standing with our, our friends at the UN, with our friends in, in NATO, with our friends in the, the, the EU, with our friends in, uh, you know, in the MENA region and in Africa, you know, across the world? How does, how does our diplomacy work when our own national security is perhaps threatened by climate change and we have pulled out of the one comprehensive agreement? as well as the comprehensive agreement like the Clean Power Plan domestically. Thanks. Brad, can I just tack on to you? If you, yeah. if you can talk about, so th there's a big difference between what we kind of see publicly and what happens behind the scenes. So I, there was a lot of news about um, the, the Pentagon climate change report not having the references, the same kind of references to climate change as it had previously. Um, but at the same time, we know that the military is obviously aware of what bases are at risk for sea level rise. Right, and so I think one, one thing that's really important with respect to climate change uh, and the national security community inside of the United States is that this goes back 20, 30 years. This is not a new issue uh, for the military or for the intelligence community. It may have been expressed more clearly in the language of climate change, but certainly risks from uh, extreme weather, risks from drought, have been part of the national security um, planning for quite some time. Um, but in terms of bases, in terms of military bases, you know, I think one of the things that is evolving over time is that it wasn't that long ago that the Department of Defense would look really only through a sea level rise uh, lens. 
and just, okay, which of these bases are too low in altitude and you know, give some percent on storm surges and call those at risk. Um, I, their aperture has over the years widened to include uh, threats from drought, from desertification, uh, protection to uh, armed, armed uh, forces from infectious disease and extreme heat. And so it's not just about physical infrastructure. There, there's also an expansion into looking at military readiness, changes in operating conditions, uh, long-term financial uh, outlays that may be required to, uh, to take on new types of missions, not just new areas, but new types. Like you know, what we saw uh, about five years ago in West Africa when the United States sent its military to deal with West, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, that was a new kind of deployment. I mean, we, there's training in the military, but it was kind of a representative, some new missions that the United States has had to take on. So um, they also think a lot about disaster response and humanitarian assistance. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the Department of Defense and the, and the intelligence community are quite large. And so they made of human beings. Uh, and so they, they don't, you know, the, the same kinds of starts and stops that you see in other parts of the government, uh, you see in, in those entities as well. And not everything necessarily should be seen as nefarious if some references get dropped out over time. I learned over the years, because I was in the intelligence community for 10 years and wrote things that you can Google. It doesn't have my name attached, thankfully. Um, <laughs> and it, it took me a while to realize that there were people who would track what was written each year. It's like, oh, they left out, you know, they didn't mention wildfires this year. I wonder what kind of thing was up with that. I'm sorry, um, we're those people. Yeah. <laughs> sorry on your behalf. Uh, so, um, <laughs> And in terms of diplomacy, I don't know, Kim, if you want to uh, handle that. Um, but I, I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of the national security aspects of a breakdown in, in the United States role in global diplomacy, I think it's, a lot is unwritten. I mean, it's, re it's really new. We're in a different era. Is it irreversible or are we going through some kind of burp uh, internationally? Should mention, the United States is not the only uh, country going through some struggles, right? I mean, it's not just us. It's not just, I mean, Britain has had its version. Spain has had its version. Germany has had its version, Brazil. Uh, and I don't, I'm not talking about left-right politics. I'm just talking about retraction from the international uh, governance structure. Um, I'll just add, and, and I don't have an answer to the question that, that you put, but I will share an anecdote, which I think just reflects how long the break in trust can persist um, with the, like, the reputation of the U.S., I was negotiating in Morocco on the um, night of the election. It was, you know, the election, the 2016 election was decided as we were starting our day um, in Marrakesh. And so we arrived with the election results and had to go into the room and negotiate um, implementation provisions of the Paris Agreement with uh, represent representatives from around the globe. And we immediately on that morning faced backlash of you always do this to us, US, you get in agreements and then you back out. Um, and it was very personally directed towards members of our delegation, um, but it was a sense that the US is not a real um, persistent player in the things that it creates. You create these regimes and you back out. Um, and so I do think that has a hit on you. If you wanna build something and you want buy-in and you want international order, you need to buy into that. A set of rules and show that it works by being a part of it. 
Um, so what does that mean long term? I don't know. There's a whole lot of factors that are driving what our international relationships look like and what will be who will be the leaders of defining future world order. But I think that does does something have an impact when you withdraw out of it and don't buy in and don't act like you're a participant? I think the answer is yes. Hi, um, you spoke a little bit about the diplomatic levers that the US employed to try to um, kind of move the Paris Agreement along. I'm curious if there are other parties who have kind of the opposite intent and who are looking to shape it to maybe a less robust framework. And if you could describe that both in terms of countries that have existing energy interests, for example, but also um, potentially countries that think they may have an opportunity to benefit from the impacts of climate change. Yeah, there is absolutely a negotiating block of countries who sought to reduce the ambition globally. Um, you know, you could imagine folks like Saudi Arabia, it was folks like uh, in the group was Iran, Pakistan, there's a like minded developing country negotiating block. Uh, a big part of their rationale and arguing for their position is that we should not have to commit to take actions when you developed countries are the source of the problem. Um, it's sort of this historic responsibility argument that was their um, basis for their position. But a big degree of that you can see in folks like Saudi Arabia in their participation in these kind of arguments is self-interest. Um, they're, they're very concerned about how it would impact the value of their oil if the change happens too fast. So you could certainly see that. They're at the same time some of the countries who are seeing the most immediate impacts of climate change sure. too, right? Certainly Saudi Arabia. Hi, um, thank you guys for sharing your insight. Um, so, um, so one um, detriment of climate change is the, uh, the thinning ice on, on the Arctic Circle. And then to tie, to tie up the diplomatic issue with the Ar Arctic, so um, there, there is a growing concern over the Arctic shipping route and how the diplomatic dynamic of it and um, how like China and publish an entire new blue book on the Arctic issue, and then how Obama administration sent or invaded the uh, Canadian Plain Sea um, Sea territory, and then how Mike Pompeo just a few months ago called a, a Canadian claim over the water uh, illegitimate. So um, mm -hmm. I just want to hear your your thought on on that and the future of the uh, future of diplomatic issue around the Arctic Circle. Basically, we're having melting that's opening new shipping channels that are very attractive to a lot of countries. So there's a fair amount of competition over them. Um, anyone? Uh, well, you know, I don't uh, have any information specific to that claim. Uh, I was in the State Department when uh, Secretary Pompeo made that comment, uh, which was um, a bit surprising to some of us uh, in the in the Harry S. Truman building. Um, but I think just in terms of Arctic uh, diplomacy and Arctic multilateralism going forward, I think most people know this is the uh, fastest warming part of the planet to two times or more uh, um, in terms of rate of, uh, rate of temperature war warming. There's no land underneath. I think everyone knows that. We have no compact on the Arctic like we do in Antarctica. You know, if we re-ran the 20th century, maybe we might have thought about doing that. Um, but it, what it does, it opens it up for grabs. And I think what you'll see is um, increasing participation in non-Arctic states in Arctic diplomacy. China is spearheading um, a conversation that I think others, you know, the, the Arctic ice is going to melt. There's, there's, this is an irreversible change. So bringing the negativity back in, if in the 21st century, in your lifetimes, you will see uh, summer free passage through the Arctic. Uh, and there are economic and military and other kinds of uh, uh, implications for that. 
Uh, so its importance in, on the national stage will only grow, I think. So do you have any comment? Uh, well, just to complement that is, if that situation actually happens, it's one of the long-term uh, results of climate change also. So it's not only about what we do now, it's about what we do now impacts in what we, we would happen in the future. So if that actually happens, you can also imagine what will happen in other parts of the, of the planet and what implications like geographical implications will, will, um, will bring and, and how the change in geopolitics will also be affected. How other actors will actually perhaps benefit from it or, or not. So it's something that you have to keep in mind also, I think for the long-term uh, implications of climate change as well. Pablo has some, some kind of scary notes in his notebook over there. That I couldn't <laughs> help but notice that just seem to sketch out implications of what happens at three degrees Celsius increase four degrees Celsius increase <laughs> and five degrees Celsius increase, which is horrifying for me to see on paper, but maybe yeah. maybe you could tell us a little bit about, sorry for peering over there. I couldn't, <laughs> when I saw five degrees Celsius, I was like, we're gonna need to talk about that. But uh, can, you, can you talk about what no, we know from the scientists? it's uh, just uh, stuck to me the other yeah, day, yeah. Right. I was reading this, uh, the New York Times Magazine that released an issue on what happened 30 years ago. It was a uh, 18, uh, Pages issue just related to what happened here in the U.S. 30 years ago about climate change and how the science, the science and everything was um, allegedly uh, known. So when you start to read it, uh, the first page it says what will happen if uh, it goes two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, and five degrees. So it says five degrees Celsius end of human civilization. So it is scary like <laughs> yeah you, you read it it's like wow so well it is it is what it is and then then you see three degrees celsius like forests in the arctic uh loss of most coastal cities and things that you are already seeing so when you when you heard five degrees it's it's, it's quite scary and yeah we had a new analysis come out recently showing that you know, even if we were to achieve the the goals that have been said that there would still be massive flooding in coastal cities. I mean, just, just destroying many cities as we know them. You look like you wanted to add something, Rod. Yep. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for, uh, for speaking. Uh, I find myself to be uh, a bit of a pessimist at times too. And so talking about, you know, these five degree warming scenarios um, is something that I, I do think about. Um, it's, incredibly depressing for me, uh, but I wonder if you guys can speak a little about, about the role that crises might play. So looking at specific tipping points in either the planetary or climate systems, uh, methane that's currently trapped in permafrost, if that were to leak out and then lead to accelerated warming, if those type of crises would uh, bring people to the table more, or uh, if that's really like the only thing that we, that we can count on is something catastrophic happening and then people sort of coming together. I, I would just say I don't think we need to wait till we see the horrible tipping point of methane massively leaking out. I just to see across the country today the level of awareness of the general public about the crisis that climate change is has really changed. Um, it's just the degree to which we have fires um, in California. We have multiple um, you know hurricanes that impact and the flooding. I mean it's not to the degree that we need people's education levels to be at, but it's still tremendous to see that change. And the um, the degree of awareness of this as an issue among a younger generation is there, right? People are facing this and seeing it as things that are impacting me today. Um, and I do think that changes the political arena. We largely have a political system that's based on the votes of of a, a generation of people who are in the elder generation, right? Like that is the vast majority of voters. So the reflected outcomes of what we see in our system is based on that um, awareness and interest level in the issue. Is it gonna change? Very fast. Um, does it need to change faster than what it's been? Of course, like we needed this political action to happen, you know, decades ago in order to have the nice glide path we needed to solve this problem in a way that would be least damaging, damaging to people on the planet. But still, I'm at least an optimist that we uh, don't need to wait so far as to that tragic point 
where it's really hard to imagine what life looks like after you hit some of those tipping points on the planet. Um, so I, I'm an optimist that we don't need to, that we are there. The, the political change, it's just, there's a latency period between when it shows up in the outcomes, the political outcomes, but it's happening. I would just add to that too. We already know that a majority of Americans want action on climate change and something that most people are concerned about. I think the pushback that you see is much more coming from, from industry. And when you have people who care, but don't necessarily understand all of the specifics of what changes would be necessary, then industry ends up having a much stronger voice in the process than the people do. Um, and we know like I've, I've been watching ads um, like a lot in the last couple of weeks actually um, for the, the clean burning power of natural gas and which is, True to an extent, it is better than burning coal, but it's still a major driver of climate change, increasingly so. Um, so I really tend to think that a lot of the resistance that's happening is coming from those companies that are benefiting and not necessarily coming from the fact that like some portion of the American public is not sure, right? I think for a long time, a lot of reporting focused on whether people believe it or not. And I think that's much less of the story now than, than it was even five years ago. And, and just, you know, those tipping points, which, uh, you know, I've put quite a bit of thought into uh, thinking the social, uh, societal, and security implications of those, they're pretty terrifying. Um, I mean, we're, the, the thing about all these projections, uh, the Paris uh, commitments and business as usual, are based on past observations those tipping points change our knowledge of the earth. And so we should stay as far away as possible from those tipping points if we know where they are, which a lot more you, research needs to be. Yeah, I mean, can you explain a little bit by what you mean about tipping points? A tipping point is just a, um, a term that means you something goes through what appears to be a gradual change and then that last push mm -hmm. changes it into a new regime. So it starts changing much faster. Right, so the good visual image is a giant crack of an ice sheet that goes in the ocean. And then once it's cracked, it's pretty much irreversible. Uh, but there are many others in terms, like for example, changes in the ocean circulation, mm -hmm. changes in atmospheric circulation. Um, so there's 15, 20 that climate scientists have identified. There are a whole lot of other ones that the ecologists have studied. And so that's one of the, so when I started talking uh, today, I started out trying to move us away from a weather-centric view for exactly the reason that you're saying, is that people will more readily see these upticks in Lyme disease as an outcome of climate change or the explosion of harmful algae in Florida or all the messy seaweed that's causing havoc through the Caribbean as climate effects, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, it wasn't that long ago when people were touchy about even connecting wildfires to climate. I mean, and when I say people, I'm not talking about scientists, I'm talking about, you know, uh, com science communicators or, or the press even. Um, but we need to more readily draw the line. And, and as a scientist, you know, it's, uh, it's not that hard for me to at least assert a line. Um, but, but, the, but getting anywhere close to those tipping points is bad news. Thank you very much. Um, you talked, Kim, when you were giving your presentation, you talked about big moments and the global stock take and in the in the process and the sort of common wisdom is that the next one is the Glasgow COP in 2020. And so I'm curious about whether you see that as the sort of where countries will come to the table with new or updated NDCs. And then what what state do the negotiations need to be in at the end of the the, the Chile presidency and, and, uh, and COP25 to facilitate that happening in 2020? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I will um, say that I don't have 
the current knowledge that I used to have as a negotiator as to what's the likelihood of a country coming up and re-upping its ambition. Um, I would imagine the goal of these, creating this moment, is to have some folks who are going to come forward and do that to then create the pressure for others. In the current political environment, is that likely? <coughs> I mean, I think that the folks in the um, EU are going to be thinking about how best do we use this moment here to make sure that happens and using whatever leverage they can to figure out who among a, different, a swath of different types of countries, you know, countries from different continents, different development statuses, are able to do that and do that well. Um, and I would imagine that if that's your goal, you would have been working backtracking to think who needs support to be able to get there to be able to do it because it doesn't just happen. You don't just totally commit a new uh, uh, emissions trajectory for your economy without having back done the back work for you know well over a year in advance, right? Like you, if you want to actually achieve that, you better know what it looks like in your power sector, your agriculture sector, and so on before you come on a global stage and commit it. So you know. If this was my job, would I be thinking about that and trying to make sure it happens behind the scenes? Absolutely. But not being in the midst of it, I don't, I can't really map out for you what, what that looks like and who might be coming to the table to do that. Just, just from the U.S. perspective, most of the Democrats running for president have pledged something like being carbon neutral by 2050. Um, how, how realistic is it to set something like that as an NDC or do we think we're going to see much more like medium term targets? Yeah, I, when we were thinking about what can we put forward as a pledge, we were thinking about what can we do with actual legislation that's been enacted, mm -hmm. not something that we'd like to be able to achieve in an ideal political situation, but what can we actually do with legal authorities that are on the books and just need to be implemented. And so I do not think, and I you know, would be very surprised to see someone come forward with an international pledge that's based on a bill as opposed to something that's actually out there and capable of being used. So I would expect that there will be an effort to come forward with what's the best we can do. The, the energy uh, sector has continued to decarbonize in part, you know, like some of the emissions are um, based on natural gas operation have ticked up, but there's still fundamentally the level of development of renewables that we have across the country that's going on. It's because it's the you know, least cost power. So there's going to be some ability to change what we think we can achieve with the same uh, federal tools that existed before the Trump administration, but I would not expect it to be something that looks like a 100% clean energy pledge. Hi, um, thank you guys for coming again. Um, my question on the more the actual negotiating front, like we talked a lot about uh, today, right? Um, the negotiations, the multilateral united uh, unanimous decision negotiations take a really long time. The changes are incremental. Do you think a more polycentric approach or you know a, a pathway should be explore, uh, explored for us? You know maybe more regional negotiations for climate deals um, or maybe economic blocks or something like that that could be a little bit more flexible and doesn't take you know 150 nations to agree on one single deal. It takes multiple years, multiple years of backdoor negotiation to do. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the extent that there is some regional objectives that are set and there can be some scope for that, you know, I think that would be a fantastic development. It does take a lot of leadership in an area, in a region, in order to see that kind of agreement come into play. Um, and I think that it's, um, I, I think it's challenging to imagine that there's going to be that kind of parallel track while people are still in very much in the mode of trying to get this agreement, this international agreement off the launch pad and into full implementation and seeing where it goes. Um, but the, um, the larger picture of what do we need to do on climate, Paris Agreement was meant to be create the space for the conversations that need to happen as we assess how far have we gotten and what more do we need to do to create a space to identify and revisit those goals over time, right? And so it should be able to um, create the space for, if that's a productive space to move forward, for that to happen and not to have to wait for the rest of the international community. Um, but th I think that's as much as I can really speak to that particular scenario. Well, I would say, um, you know, the efforts that go on in things like the G20, mm -hmm. the G7, um, and the, uh, the MEF, the Major Economies Forum yeah. that was stood up 
uh, under the Obama administration. I don't think it exists anymore, which was basically a subset of the, um, the major emitting uh, countries. If you want to really do a lot of um, you know, reduction, you go to who's emitting the most. It, it makes sense. Um, you know, there are other parts of this that from land use changes and, and things like that, but it's hard for me to see anything bad coming from these kinds of engagements. It, is it enough? Probably not, but you know, it's, I think it's a tool that should be pursued irrespective of the United States participation for that matter. There were some countries that came together and made a specific coal commitment when I was at the Bonn COP. So uh, I'm, how much is, is that, you know, like countries really stretching to come to an agreement versus kind of aligning with each other and saying this was something that we wanted to do and we're going to say it together? Is that, maybe that's not the specific best example, but when you, when you see that happening, is it? So there, there is some element, like there was the high ambition coalition mm -hmm. in the lead up to the Paris Agreement, group of countries who, you know, were saying we're going to pledge to a high ambition outcome. What does that do? It creates the political um, reputation of uh, momentum of I want to be a part of the group that's going to strive towards mm -hmm. this goal. It matters that you want to be a part of that group and the positive reputation value of being a part of that group. So it does have some momentum and it does create a drive. It's most useful if it's then plugged into something that has some mechanism for follow up. Is anyone going to check in to see if the coal group did what they said they were going to do? Unless you're putting it into the Paris Agreement pledges, have a process in which you have to stand up in front of your community of international peers, explain what your pledge is, what your actual progress is, show the math, do some writing around it, and face scrutiny. And I know that the individual country representatives, when they go through that process, are actually nervous about it. They, they individually feel the, the fear of saying, I have to explain to everybody else that I am engaging with, with in this uh, negotiation process, what are we doing as a country and what's actually happened with it? Um, and so that's a meaningful m mechanism. I mean, it's not trade sanctions. It's not like sticks in, in the way that people have sometimes thought about um, pot potential sanctions for folks, but it is actually a meaningful mechanism, transparency, scrutiny into what you're doing and follow up where there can be reporting and reputational impacts is a lot more than what we have with some kind of generic pledge. So I would say the most useful way is if it's plugged into something that has some follow up and transparency to it. Uh, uh, can I also add up, uh, besides all that, is I think going back to what I said earlier today is, I think the, it's very important the subnational level uh, not only states, like, I mean, the countries, also states and regions in different countries. I think that, that also makes, uh, is, is not a huge impact, but it creates education, uh, the, the involvement of the civil society also. It's, it's, it's very important for them to keep engaged because if civil society is engaged in this, they move, they pushed on, on the political power as well. So it's also very important for, for that level. So if you wanna move it forward and make 177 countries to agree on something, it's good the civil society involvement. So it's, that's, that's also why it's important during the COP that you have the, the officials, the countries, and also at the same time, you have the NGOs and the civil society gathering at the same time. Questions? Hi, thank you all for coming and for speaking to us. Um, my question is, it was really interesting to hear about Ms. Mosniak's experience. Hopefully I said that right. Cool. Um, <laughs> in, in Morocco when Trump was elected, which brings me to wonder how much domestic policy, politics um, for countries with less clout affect negotiations. And specifically, I'm curious if you, Mr. Sal Salas, think that the widespread protests in Chile will have an effect on your negotiating power in COP25. Thank you. <laughs> That's an easy one. <laughs> you would. Well, um, regarding to Chile in general, I don't think it will have an effect. Actually, it will boost something even more because part of the of what people is 
demanding in Chile is social equality and, and justice equality and, and being able to live in a healthy environment uh, in terms of, 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 of where you live and how the contamination, pollution, and everything is addressed and the forest is part of that social justice as well. So in our case, uh, it was a good sign for, for the country to keep the presidency, even though we are not hosting the event, the conference itself, we, are keep, uh, we will keep the, the presidency. So that's a, it's a good sign. And, and I would just um, add that the, there's normally in the course of a you know, multi-year negotiation, there's gonna be some changeover in different administrations and sometimes a total flip-flop. Um, and so we were regularly adjusting for those new circumstances and taking into account the positions of a new administration in other countries as well. Um, and um, kind of figuring out what's the pathway towards agreement across these folks. We recognize that was part of the political process. And in the Paris Agreement, when we were um, thinking about what's the right structure for such a long-term plot problem is climate change, you know, the kind of thing that we know we need to keep working at this for decades for it to be done. We were recognizing that we were going to have to be able to survive multiple administration changes like that across some countries that, you know, it, it really does matter and we need them to be participating. And so this, this structure was meant to be resilient to that kind of political change. Um, certainly we didn't anticipate that we were going to be the first trial case as the U.S. <laughs> of that structure off the bat um, in thinking about it. But it is meant to be. The idea that you as a country determine what can you achieve given your economic objectives means that you can come in and have some different thinking around what the economy looks like. And there is supposed to be some flexibility to change for those po that political vision within the scope of the agreement. And that's supposed to be permissible. It's supposed to have that flex to allow for political change. And just to jump in here, because don't forget why Paris was actually structured this way. It was because of our own domestic politics in the United States, because we had no chance of going to Congress and get a treaty or anything legally blind, binding. That was off the table. But I actually think, irrespective of you know our uh, domestic problems in uh, getting laws passed, I actually think we arguably accidentally stumbled into a real 21st century way of doing multilateral governance. And instead of the 20th century top-down legalistic, you know, you're going to be, you know, uh, taken to some international court or whatever because of uh, commitments. It's a bottom up. It is, what can you do? What can you commit to? Uh, and I actually think it's a model for, I mean, United States, we can't even sign on to the Law of the Sea uh, Treaty. The most obvious thing that we need to do, we, we can't even do that. But it, it, it creates this template, I think, for difficult um, um, issues, environmental and otherwise, uh, into the 21st century. And I think we just haphazardly walked into something that may be quite brilliant. Um, I would just disagree with it being haphazard. Yeah, haphazard's <laughs> not the right word. I don't mean haphazard at all. Um, but our, our decision to do that was dictated by domestic uh, hurdles. I think we have time for one more brief question. We outlasted them. <laughs> <laughs> would you, uh, our panelists, would you like to add any closing thoughts? No? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming, and uh, I'm sure we'd love to take any additional questions you have for us. Thank you. Thank you.